And uh, that's what our series is about right now this, this month is Tell Me the Story. We started last week talking about a story and we, we started from the beginning and we walked through the idea about God's love for us and the story and how Jesus was a part of that from the very beginning and what he would be coming to do was a part of that from the beginning. This week I want to remind you about the conflict. Every story has a conflict, right? There's a plot in a story, that, that line that we follow of where the story is headed, the direction that it's going. And this Christmas story that we tell and that we know and that really we are a part of as well, this Bible story reveals a conflict also and it most definitely points out the direction that the story is headed. But the plot in this Christmas story is much larger often than people catch at first glance. If you think about the story that we just saw in the journey to Bethlehem and the child that was born that night, but there's a much bigger picture of what's going on, a much more all-encompassing plot than might first meet the eye. The baby in the manger that we celebrate came for a purpose, and in his own words later on he would say, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And we find that in John 10, verse 10. The story is about the fulfillment of the promise of God. The promise of God. A promise is an awesome thing. A promise is a binding thing, right? I watched Courtney with, I think it was Natalie earlier this week, and Natalie came up and she says, pinky promise, you know, and she got mom by the pinky and she said, pinky promise, you know. She knows that's a guarantee. She said, this is the deal, you know. When the promise is made, it's solid. She could count on it. She could bank on it. And, you know, promises are like that, although we as people find sometimes we're not always so good at keeping our promises. But the Word of God says that he cannot lie. And so in his promises, he tells the truth and he makes good on what he has promised. And this story is about the fulfillment of the promise of God. Many have mistakenly thought that the Bible is a book of rules and laws. So many people think it's all about the the, the do's and the don't do's and in this way and that way and all the rules and laws that are in that. But in Scripture, before the law was ever given, before Moses received it, before God inscribed it on tablets of stone, before the law was ever given, a promise was spoken. A promise was spoken. What's even more beautiful is that in Scripture we can read and learn that there will come a time when the law is no longer even needed. And Scripture tells us that the law is for lawbreakers, and there will come a time with God's redeemed people that the law is no longer even necessary. It's not needed. But what remains after the law is still the promise. The promise remains. And the story of the Bible is not about rules and laws. The story of Jesus, the Son of God, born in a stable in Bethlehem, is not about teaching us to be better people. I've run into so many people over time. Well, yeah, Jesus is a good teacher, and he's one of many good teachers because he teaches us to be better people, right? And I'm like, whoa, back up the truck. Jesus did not come to teach us to be better people. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people live. He came to make dead people live. And last week we talked about who he is, the Son of God, the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And we touched on our accountability before him. He's the one who made it all and the one that we belong to. So we are accountable before him. And there is a day coming when everyone will give an account to him. And when our first parents broke faith with God in the garden, we can read that the story did not turn to punishment because of God's wrath. God didn't pour out on his, his wrath on them and destroy them in that moment. God didn't vent his anger and his fury and say, you're so sorry, I'm just going to wipe you out. But what we see, in fact, is that the story turned to a declaration of his compassion and a story of redemption. God had told Adam and Eve in the garden that on the day that they ate from that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they would die. We read and know that they didn't die physically that day, right? They went on. There were other things that happened. So was God's word true? Oh, yes. Because they indeed did die that day. They were separated from the source of life. The one who gives life to every man. Separated from him. 
And they died spiritually that day. God had told them that they would die in that moment. And the conflict began in the garden. There was an enemy there, a tempter, the one who desires to steal and kill and destroy. But there is truth also in the statement that we often are our own worst enemy, right? We are often our own worst enemy. While there was temptation there, there was a decision in the hearts of our first parents to rebel against God's created order. And the battle against death was born in the hearts of men. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And so death and a curse passed on to us. But we also see in the garden that God is the one strong enough to squeeze a blessing out of a curse. Part of the beauty of his nature, even God can, can, can squeeze the blessing out of a curse. And so we find because a result of the sin uh, that our first parents brought us into that same nature that all of us carry. We see the pronouncement of pain, the pain in childbearing. We see the toil that mankind would labor by the sweat of their brow just to produce enough to survive on. The struggle and the conflict for power and control and rivalry with each other and that death was on the way. These bodies wear out, they decay, and they die. But in the middle of that, he announces a promise. And in Genesis 3.15, we read, as God was saying, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between the enemy and the woman, and between your offspring, your seed and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And in that was the beginning of the promise of God to turn things around, to bring victory out of defeat and to bring life back to those who had died. God's promise was that he would provide a way to make us alive again. He spoke of a seed, and he later developed that thought as a king. He spoke of the seed of the woman that day, and he developed that promise later on through Abraham as he said, through your seed, through your family line, I'm going to bless all the nations. I'm going to bring them back to me. He declared later in Genesis through that, that family line of Abraham, down through Isaac and Jacob, and Joseph, but Jacob's sons that became the 12 tribes of Israel. In Genesis 49 and verse 10, there was a prophecy given as he said that the scepter would not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he would come to whom the obedience of the nations would belong. And so he spoke of a king. And they held on to that promise, and the promise developed more as it came to David. David, who was a man after God's own heart, and said, God, I want to build a house for you. And God said, David, you're not the one to build a house for me, but I'm going to build a house for you. An everlasting dynasty, because from your family is going to come the king whose reign will never end. And so he developed this promise, the seed, the king, what was coming. We look back at it, and we know that his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And so we live in that time of being able to look back on this story and rejoice in what God has done. And the passage that I wanted to bring you to this morning that declares so clearly what God has done for us in his promises in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Paul is writing to the church and he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This passage speaks so plainly. I don't think there's any passage in Scripture that could say it any more clear. He says, we were dead 
Dead men walking. You know, we watch different movies and you hear stories that talk. Dead men walking. That was us. That's our story. Dead men walking around. Walking around, going through the motions of life, but lifeless on the inside. We were dead, but God, in the middle of that passage, that was our situation, but God intervenes and steps in, in the middle, and changes things. He's the game changer. He's the one that makes something new and different happen for us. We were dead, but God made us alive. And the reality is that life without him is no life at all. We bump around in life going through the things and and all the things that we do, but it is no life at all. This is the state of mankind apart from the gospel, living still in rebellion to God's authority, dead on the inside, wasting away on the outside. And left to our own devices, mankind only increases in depravity. You know, there's constantly this idea that we can build this ideal world, that we can create a utopia, that if we could just control the circumstances, if we could just eradicate hunger, if we could just wipe out the poverty, if we could just make a nice environment for everybody, that everybody would play nice and get along. Everybody would be good people. Everybody would do good things, and we would just evolve. It's been proved over and over and over again. That's not the nature of mankind. That's not the way that society and civilization goes. But in fact, it goes just as Scripture tells us. You know, from the time of Adam and Eve, we roll to the story of their sons, Cain and Abel. And we see that no longer is it just rebellion against God, but, but the strife between one another as brother rise up, rises up to kill his brother. In Noah's day, we find that God said the thoughts of their hearts were just wickedness constantly. And he was grieved at creating us. And yet we remember last week it was because of his love for us that he showed compassion. We come right on down to the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 3, which tells us as time goes on, he says it's going to go from bad to worse as far as the nature of mankind is concerned. We're not on an upward trend. We're not arriving. We're not finding our way through. We're not even learning the lessons from the past. But God says that he intervened and those who were dead, he made alive. Scripture tells us that we were created to worship him and to serve him. And our efforts to be our own God only subjected us to a cruel master bent on our destruction. But God came in and provided us both mercy and grace. Mercy and grace. Mercy being not giving us what we do deserve. Grace being giving us what we did not deserve. Very well spoken in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that says the wages of sin is death. The wages are what you earned, right? That's what you get paid at the end of the week for what you did. You earned this. Here it is. There's your paycheck. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God that's given to you undeserved, unpurchased, handed to you as a gift, is life, eternal life in Jesus Christ. Mercy and grace in Him. We didn't need good teaching so that we could be better and try harder. All of our trying comes to nothing. Our own efforts will get us nowhere. We needed total transformation. We needed to go from death to life. From death to life. And last week we focused on the love of God. That he had made this plan from the beginning. And in spite of how grieving it is to see his creation under the weight of sin. God and his compassion for us. And those who would respond to his grace and faith. And who would be his people for all eternity. Was willing to bear the weight of the sin. And go through what had to happen. Because he loved us that much. That's awesome love. That's awesome love. Just as we talked about last week, Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, God fully knowing what was going to happen, chose to do it anyway. And this week, we need to consider again the promise of God, his promise made from that beginning to take us from death back to life, the promise of God and the way that we approach this faith, the faith that we have in him. This faith that we have, this celebration that we have, this coming together that we do, this worshiping of Him, it's not about rules and laws and regulations. 
That kind of heart that thinks we're doing the obligation, that we're under the thumb, that we're being forced and compelled in those things, that produces religious, legalistic, hard, and bitter people. People who have no compassion for others, but look at them and say, well, I got to do it, you got to do it too, you know? And sour and bitter and hard, it doesn't produce the love of God. But this story is not about law and rules. This story is about life. It's about love and life that comes from Him. And that story of love and life produces gratitude, love, compassion, and submissive obedience. It produces people with joy and peace and hope. To think that someone rescued us from death. If you could imagine being in prison and being on death row, the sentence that is on you, you know, the life sentence that's been placed on you. And you're just waiting, but you know inside you deserve what's coming and the sentence is there, fearful though it may be. And yet someone comes and says, hey, your sentence has been lifted. You're free. The overwhelming joy and gratitude that would flow from that. Maybe in a more common area, if we can think about being on the edge of the the cliff when the ground begins to give way and somebody who snatches us right off the edge of the abyss. That's what God has done for us. And we've all seen stories about somebody who pushed somebody out of the way of coming death or somebody who grabbed them just at the opportune time and the, the pledges and promises that come out of, oh man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay by your side till I can repay the debt. You know, you saved my life. You gave me another chance. Uh, anything I could do for you. That's the kind of heart it produces in us because that's what he's done for us. He rescued us from death. And nothing we could do for him would ever be too much. And out of what he's done, death then is no longer our destiny. We no longer walk under the weight of that. We're no longer dead people walking under the weight of this world and the despair and depression that goes along with it. We are destined for life. This is the promise that God gave to us. In writing about resurrection life that we have in Christ, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. People complicate the story of God in their minds in trying to grasp what he's trying to tell us. It's really very simple in all that he's done for us. In him we pass from death to life. The death sentence has been lifted. We've been snatched back from the edge of the abyss. We've been transformed from the inside out. People who were lost in that same following of sin, the change happens on the inside out as his life is infused back into us and we're made alive again in him. The conflict then is resolved. That conflict, that heart that rebels and desires to go its own way is resolved in Christ. It's the fulfillment of God's promise. And it came to us as a gift wrapped as a little baby in a stable in Bethlehem. And because of that, we have the opportunity. Our prayers can be like David's. In Psalm 119, 41 We read David's words, May your unfailing love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. I hope we never get tired of how amazing the story is. You know, Christmas, we tell the story year after year, and we we put up the signs and the emblems and the symbols, and we look at the manger, and we we even act it out again, that journey to Bethlehem. And I admire you know, Mary and Joseph for what they did in following God. And we love to celebrate the beauty of this newborn child and the shepherds who came to worship and the the kings who came to bring gifts. But I hope we never get tired of the beauty of the story that this was the pinnacle moment of God fulfilling the promise that he gave to us. He loved us enough to make us, not to destroy us in our sin, but to find a way to bring us back to him. Overwhelming love and promise. I don't know how you look at the story of God, but there's a new way we need to communicate that. Because if we've communicated it as a means of escape from hell, if we've communicated it as God's laws, we've communicated it as, as what you have to do, we've missed the mark in telling the story. This is a story of love. 
This is a story of promise. This is a story of hope and joy and peace that fills our hearts. This story is not about rules and religion, but about love and life in him. The Father's promise come to us. It should change the way we worship and our gratitude to him. And it's a story we need to share because there's people out there who need to hear and to know. Who need to step out of walking in death to walking in life that we have in him. We're going to participate in communion today as we honor what he's done for us. And we've saved our worship for the end of this service this morning. So we take communion together. Then we're going to step into a time of worship this morning as we honor him today. I'd like to ask you, if you would, to stand with me for a moment. I want to pray with you and for you this morning. I don't want to lead us into a time of taking communion today. Father, Lord, as we've come into this place and we've seen the beauty of your story played out again this morning, as we've sung about it in songs of worship, as we've watched our children display and portray the beauty of your story of Jesus coming, Lord, may we be reminded that that baby in the stable was planned thousands of years before. In eternity before you chose to create the world, to create Adam and Eve and place them in the garden, you knew what it would cost you. And you loved us enough to do it anyway. And God, you placed them there and you walked through the stages of the story. And even when we failed, your Lord, your anger wasn't aroused to destroy us. But Lord, your compassion was aroused to squeeze a blessing out of a curse. Lord, to give us hope where there was none. Lord, you developed that promise and you've patiently played out that story. Lord, to allow as many as possible to be a part of that story and to be a part of your people for all eternity. Lord, may we see it with the joy and gratitude of rescue. Lord, we've been rescued by you, given a fresh start, a second chance, a new beginning, life for death. Lord, may we worship you fully. May we honor you completely. Lord, may we share the story of hope and joy and peace that we have in you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to take communion this morning. As a church family, we practice open communion. You do not have to be a member of our church to partake of communion here this morning. We just ask that you honor the communion for what it is, a remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us. Jesus made the story so plain in fulfilling that promise. In Luke 22, we read about how just before he was going to die on the cross, it was the time of the Passover, and he looked back to God's deliverance of a people out of bondage, his people out of bondage into freedom, and he said, that was just a picture. The real bondage that we live in is the bondage to sin and death. But he said, I'm going to deliver you out of that. And so he said, you see this bread that you partake of every day on the table? He said, when you look at it, I want you to see something different. Because just as we break this bread and tear it apart, he said, my body's being broken for you so that you can have life in you. He said, this cup that sits on the table that you drink from freely and you, you celebrate in the, in the meal, he said, I want you to see in that my blood that's being poured out for you to wash your sins away that you can be alive again in me. So he said, every time you see it, I want you to remember. So when we come together, we make a small table. We don't have the big table of having our whole meal together. We do that from time to time. But we have a small table before us with the bread and the cup on it to remind us of those things, to remind us of all that he's done for us. And so we give thanks for it again today in our worship for him. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for your giving yourself up, Lord for putting on skin and coming and walking among us and then laying that skin down to be beaten, to be abused, to be broken, Lord, in our place. It wasn't that we were pardoned for our sin. It's that someone else stepped in and took the execution and the punishment for us. Jesus, you took the full weight of our sin and our punishment, the full sentence of death, gladly laying it down for what was to come. Because you knew if you laid your life down, you could take it up again. And in so doing, you could give life to us. So, Lord, as we come forward today and we take a piece of the bread and we dip it in the cup, Lord, we remember what you've done for us, your body and your blood that puts 
life in us again. And so we celebrate you today, and we celebrate you in this moment and all that you've done. With worship and praise, worthy of a king, worthy of a redeemer, worthy of the one who's loved us so. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to enter into a time of worship. We're going to take communion together. And you'd be invited just to come forward to the table on either side of the front here. Take a piece of the bread, dip it in the cup, and, and partake of that. We're here as families today. I would encourage you to take a moment to pray with your family today or pray with some friends, some of the church family that we're here with. If there's something on your heart that we can pray with each other about, let's lift each other up in prayer and let's make this a time of worship this morning. The table's prepared before you. Please come and, come and partake.